Thank you all very much. I know I'm between you and lunch, so I'll try to talk fast. Believe it or not, Russ and I are not going to talk about radical candor today. We're going to talk about how to build a kick-ass team. The more fun part of, of building a company than giving feedback. And this is something that I somewhat arrogantly always thought that I was really great at. I thought I was one of the best people in the world at building an, an amazing team. And I did get to work with a bunch of amazing people. But then when I started working at Apple, I had a conversation with an executive there who told me something that made me realize that I had been throughout my entire career systematically undervaluing some of the most important people on my teams. And even worse, I had not been living in accordance with my own personal humanity. So this was, this was a big drink of water. What did she tell me? What did this executive tell me? She said that when she was building a high-performing team, she felt like it was really important to understand that the people, the rock stars on her team and the superstars on her team needed very different things. Things. What the hell is the difference between a superstar and a rock star? The superstars, she said, were the people on her team who were going to change everything. Right? These were the people on her team who were going to be responsible for the Schumpterian change. Right? They were going to be the force of growth on, on her team. The rock stars, on the other hand, were the people on her team who didn't want her job. They didn't want her boss's job. They didn't want to be Steve Jobs. They were just really freaking great at their job, and they would keep doing it often for years if she didn't screw it up, right? So when, you, when she said, when you think about your superstars, you can think about the people who want to change the world, but when you think about your rock stars, you're going to want to think about the rock of Gibraltar, right? Not Ozzy Osbourne or somebody. The rock of Gibraltar. These are the people who are going to be the force of excellence and stability on your team. And when she told me this, I started to think about dozens of people who had worked for me. There was one guy in particular, Derek, who led customer support. He was the first customer support person that we hired at a startup I did years and years ago. And the customers loved Derek. They just adored him. They would send him like homemade donuts. Forget about NPS score. The real test of a great customer support person is do you get baked goods in the mail, right? And this guy got baked goods in the mail. So as the company was growing, I naturally said to Derek, do you want to lead the support team? And Derek said to me, no. My real ambition, this was, the company was in New York, my real ambition is to be a Broadway actor. And what I really want to do is I want to leave work every day at 5 o'clock so that I can get to these off-Broadway productions that I do. And that's where I made the mistake. I wrote Derek off. Right at that moment, I totally wrote him off. I went out and I hired the person I thought I was supposed to hire. I hired this super ambitious guy who really didn't care at all about customer support. What he really wanted to do was be the CEO, but that's how you build a high-performing team, right? You overhire. And Derek came charging into my office and Derek said to me, he had this whole story about Ayn Rand and the Fountainhead and of course you need your, you need your architect and the architects change the world, but you also need to turn the lights on. And for that, you need a great electrician. And if you're going to hire a great electrician, you don't want to hire a C-plus architect. You want to hire an A-plus electrician. This kind of made sense to me, but Derek wasn't leading the team. This other guy that I had hired was, so I let him do it his way. Pretty soon, the inevitable happened. Derek quit. The homemade donut stopped, net promoter score went down, and revenue followed suit, right? So I, by, by, deep, by not understanding what a contribution that Derek was making to the team, I was not building a high-performing team. I was not doing as good a job as I could have. And this made me realize that the way that we tend to think about talent management gets it exactly wrong. I mean, on one axis, obviously, you do need to understand excellent performance and the difference between excellent performance and low performance. But usually the vertical axis, when we think about uh, so-called talent planning, we use the word potential. And as we learned in the debates last night, words matter. And potential, <laughs> potential is the wrong word. Potential is exactly the wrong word. The, the problem with potential is that when you put someone 
when you mark someone as low potential, you're, you're devaluing your rock stars off, off the bat. So instead, I propose you use the word growth trajectory. And there's nothing good or bad about a steep growth trajectory or a gradual growth trajectory. It's just at different phases in our career, and we're all at different phases of our career at different points. You're either going to be on a steep or a gro gradual growth trajectory. And when you look at your team this way, you sort of identify five different modes that people can be in. They can be in in superstar mode, they can be in rock star mode. And you need to give them very different things. And I promise I'm going to talk about that in a, in a moment. The majority of people on your team, of course, will be doing good work, but not great work. And there's, there's a way that you can use your, super, your rock stars to help them improve. There's always going to be the, those puzzling people who ought to be doing great, but aren't. I'll tell you what to do about them. And then, of course, there's the people who you ought to be firing, but you're not. And I'll talk to you about how to, how to find the courage to, to do that. So I'm going to talk more about how to use this framework in a second. But I want to leave you, as, as we draw it out, with one most most important message, which is there are no permanent markers, right? Don't write people's name in a box and leave them there. Don't use this as a label for individuals. Use this to understand what a person wants at a moment in time. Use this to understand what the dreams are of the people who work for you and to help them take a step in the direction of, the, of their dreams, not your dreams, their ambitions, not your ambitions. Right? Okay. In case that sounds too namby-pamby, I'm going to talk to you about four specific things you can do to build a badass team. First, thought partner. One of the biggest mistakes that people often make with their, their, the people who are doing the best on their team, both the rock stars and the superstars, is they think, I'm just going to hire these great people and get out of their way. Let them do their thing. I don't want to micromanage them, right? And that's sort of like deciding that the best way to build a good marriage is to marry the right person and then avoid spending a single second with them, right? It would be sort of like my calling my husband after this talk and saying, Andy, I'm not coming home for dinner tonight or any other night. You're doing a great job raising those kids and I don't want to micromanage you, right? That's not going to go down very well with Andy, right? Don't do that to the people who work for you either. They, they want to work for you because they want to work for you. So keep your top performers top of mind. What does it mean to be a thought partner? You obviously don't want to be an absentee manager, but you also don't want to be a micromanager, right? So thought partners are people who are curious. They know when they need to know more. Absentee managers lack curiosity. They, they really don't want to know. And the micromanager, of course, pretends to know it all. The thought partner asks why. The absentee manager says nothing. The micromanager tells people how to do it. The thought partner asks about relevant details. The absentee manager is afraid of the details. And the micromanager is lost in the details, right? The thought partner is able to anticipate problems. The absentee manager is un aware of problems, and the micromanager is eager to punish people when problems arise. The thought partner shares context. The one thing that you have that the people working for you don't have is breadth. They have depth, you have breadth usually. Absentee manager is even unaware of the context, and the micromanager, of course, is hoarding information. So use, use this sort of simple framework to make sure that you're landing in the right place. Okay. Second thing you can do, second way you can use the framework. You want to take the time to help every single person on your team grow in the way that they want to grow. This is not your grandfather's talent planning that I'm talking about. It's a really simple process, doesn't have to take you a ton of time, that you should do once a year. Basically, all you need to do is create a shared document, get everybody who reports directly for you to put the names of the people in the box that best describes what mode they feel they're in, and then calibrate, because you're going to have different definitions of what excellent performance is. You're going to have different definitions of what's a steep growth trajectory, what's a gradual growth trajectory, when you need what. So use this opportunity to make sure you're all on the same page. And once everybody is calibrated, take a few minutes to make, and make everyone on your team do this. Take a few minutes to write down some clear action that you're going to do for each of 
each direct report. So you do it for each of your direct reports, they do it for each of their direct reports. Don't mix this up with performance reviews if you do performance reviews. So what am I talking about? What are the specific actions you can take for each person? For the people who are your superstars, for the people who are going to drive growth on your team, what you want to do is you want to offer them new challenges, right? You want to keep them learning. The last thing you want to do is squash them. Shortly after I joined Google, Larry Page told me a story about a time when he had a summer job and his boss gave him a project that was supposed to take him the whole summer. And Larry, of course, had an idea of how he could get it done in 12 hours or less. And his boss said, oh, no, no, no. We don't, you know, he wanted to clip Larry's wings. I, uh, we're going to do it the way we've always done it. You have to spend the whole summer on it. And it was a source of enormous frustration for Larry. He looked at me and he said, I don't want anybody at Google to have that experience ever. No clipping the wings of the superstars. And it's part of the reason why Google is such a great place to work, I think. They've done a really good job making sure that they're helping people grow, helping people define a path to promotion. If you get assigned a coach, if you can find people who can teach your superstars new things, who are a few years ahead of them, it's going to go a long way to help you retain them. Make sure you identify a successor, though, because often you can't retain your superstars. They're going to leave you better than they found you. Make the most of them while you get them, but don't assume they're going to stick around forever, because they often don't. And whatever you do, don't confuse management and growth. Don't manage or track the people on the, super, uh, on the super steep growth trajectory. Often, especially engineers, the last thing in the world they want to do is be a manager, but that doesn't mean that they're not on a super steep growth trajectory. So make sure you're giving the right kinds of challenges to the right people. Next, your rock stars. These are the people who you shouldn't promote. People often meet this assertion with great resistance. It feels like a punch in the stomach. It feels like I'm telling you to punish your rock stars. There's two really good reasons why you might not want to promote somebody. The first, anybody ever read The Peter Principle? One of the great management books of all time. Read it if you haven't. You don't want to promote someone into a job that they're not good at. If they're great at doing something, you don't want to promote them be beyond their level of competence. That's one. But there's also times in life when a person really doesn't want a promotion. So let's take the case of T.S. Eliot, Nobel Prize winning poet. Before he could make his, his living as a poet, he was a clerk at Lloyd's of London. And his boss famously said, I see no reason why in time, in time, mind you, Eliot might not be an assistant branch manager. T.S. Eliot did not give a shit about becoming assistant branch manager at Lloyd's of London, right? What he wanted to do, really, if his boss had wanted to retain him, was to get home an extra hour early so he had more time to write his poetry. So there are good reasons. The, the, the Derek, he didn't want, he didn't want to be the manager. He didn't want a bigger job. He wanted to keep his current job. So don't create an organization that is so obsessed by promotion and status that it feels humiliating for the rock stars to stick around, right? You want to make sure that you give them fair bonuses and fair ratings. Often you don't. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Often you want to set them up as gurus. Your, your rock stars are often going to be the people, they love their craft, they're great at it, they're better than anybody in the company, and they can help bring the people in the middle along. They can help, help turn good performance into excellent performance from others. So if they have an interest in teaching, by all means, let them teach. And finally, give them respect. Don't do to your rock stars what I did to Derek. And what I did to Derek was, it was not just bad for Derek, it was not just bad for my team and, and the company, the startup where I was working, it was bad for me because there came a time inevitably in my life when I was the one on a more gradual growth trajectory. This happened in 2008 and I, I found myself in the following situation, short, old, and pregnant with twins, right? So. High risk pregnancy, extremely high risk pregnancy. Right at this moment in my career, one of the board members at Twitter came to my office at Google and said, would you be interested in throwing your hat in the ring to become the next CEO of Twitter? Now, 
a year before this happened, I probably would have cut off my left arm for that opportunity, but now I wasn't so sure I wanted it. I called my doctor, and I said to my doctor, what do you think? And she said, well, just ask yourself this question. What's more important, that job or the hearts and lungs of your children? <laughs> Easy question to answer, right? Now, before you attack my doctor as an anti-feminist, let me just remind you, this was a high-risk pregnancy. There are plenty of women who are pregnant with twins who can charge ahead without missing a beat. This is Margaret Thatcher, the day she had her twins. The day, right? No problem, didn't miss a beat. That's not the situation I was in. This is the situation that I was in. How's that for radical candor? All right? So, that is why I didn't want to take that job. And so I stayed at Google where I already had a job that I was really good at. And it wasn't going to, I was going to have time, in fact, because I already knew how to do this job, to take advantage of the prenatal massage, one floor up, and the delicious snacks at every turn. Turns out Google is the perfect place for a high risk pregnancy. <laughs> I recommend it. And I carried the terms to the twins to term, made it all the way to 38 weeks, right? So thank you, Google. I owe you. Big time. Now, I felt good, obviously. I felt not just good, I felt great about the decision I had made. It was obviously right for my family and my life. But even then, I was still sort of ambivalent about what that decision had done for my career. And it wasn't until I learned about the superstars and the rock stars that I understood that it had been good, not only for my team at Google, at Google because all of them got opportunities that they never would have gotten otherwise because I was on bed rest. It was good for Google because they did great things for the business, but it was also good for me because when I was on bed rest was when I realized that the thing that I really care about is the craft of management. It wasn't cost per click, right? And in a sort of almost poetic twist of fate, what happened was the CEO of Twitter, Dick Costolo, invited me to be his coach, which was a job that gave me plenty of time to write the book, Radical Candor, which I I hope you all are going to run out and pre-order after this. And also to start a company with Russ that's going to build the Candor Coach, which will eliminate all bad bosses from the world. So sometimes it all works out, right? But only if you respect your rock stars, and only if you balance growth and stability on your team, only if you really understand when you need on your team more people who are on that steep growth trajectory and when you need more people who are on a gradual growth trajectory. Now most of you all are leading su super high growth companies and you, so you probably need more superstars than rock stars but I can guarantee you you need some rock stars. I've seen the wheels come off the bus more than once when teams don't have enough rock stars, when they, they aren't very conscious about making sure they're getting this ratio right. So balance, growth, and stability. So what do you do for the people who are in the middle? I'm going to assert that there's no such thing as a B player, right? Nobody is here forever. Nobody just is only capable of doing good work. Everybody is capable of doing exceptional work. So you offer them radical candor. That often, that means good feedback, praise and criticism. That's going to move them over. You educate them. You offer them training opportunities. You give your rock stars the opportunity to teach them how to do exceptional work. Give them stretch projects that give them an opportunity to soar or to fail. And if they're here too long, you're going to have to have some really hard conversations about helping them find another role where they can eventually excel. What about these people? These are the people who ought to be doing great but are failing for some reason. I call this the look yourself in the mirror quadrant. You may have them in the wrong role. This is the most common reason for this. You may have given somebody too much too fast. You've all grown really fast in your careers and sometimes you make the mistake of assuming that everybody else around you can do what you can do and they may not be able to. Have you made expectations clear enough? Do you need to give these people clearer feedback? 
Do they need a new manager? Sometimes people just don't get along with their boss. Are they having a personal problem that's temporary that you can just help them get through? Maybe it's just a bad fit. That's not just a word. Sometimes people just are not a good fit for a company, right? What about these people who are not doing well and they're not getting better? It's not nice to these people to ignore their low performance. They're capable of doing something great somewhere. And it's really profoundly unfair to everyone else on your team who's doing great work if you don't move these people along, right? Okay. Third thing you can do, fair ratings. Way too often you reserve all the best ratings and all the bonus pool that you have, if you have one, for the people who are on a steep growth trajectory, for your so-called superstars, right? And then what happens is that these people get lower ratings than those, even though in that given moment in time they're doing work that's equally as good. In fact, they get the same ratings as people who are just doing okay and not great, which is not fair, so they get pissed off and they leave, or in order to pay them fairly, you promote them inappropriately, and then they crumble right? Don't do that to your rock stars. And last but not least, the fourth thing you can do, the most fun thing you can do as a leader of a team with your direct reports, and the most fun thing you can get them to do with their, with their direct reports is to have career conversations. And Russ Laraway is going to tell you how to do that after lunch. Thank you very much.